uh, if you have your Bibles and want to turn in them with me, uh, please turn to 1 Corinthians. We're continuing uh, in our study in 1 Corinthians. We've been uh, in this letter now for several months, uh, and, and we've gotten up to uh, chapter 4, and today we're going to look at uh, the section right after where we ended last week, which is beginning in verse 6, and I'll read down through verse 13. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 through verse, uh, verse 13. Hear the, the word of the Lord. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us, you have become kings, and would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. And this is God's word. May the Lord bless the reading and the preaching and the hearing of his word this morning. So when I was a, when I was a kid, um, the, the sport that I was least effective in, or I guess I can put it another way, I was terrible at it, was, uh, was baseball. It was baseball. And I played every sport that was in my little town, and, um, and regardless of how good I was at them, I wanted to play, and baseball, though, was my worst. I was, I was the kid that was, you know, so bad he could never hit, could never connect with the ball. I was the kid that was so bad that they would put way out there in the field so the ball would never come to him. But I had, I had one day, one day, and I literally mean maybe up to 24 hours, where I, I thought my future was to be a major league baseball player and a, and a pitcher. And, and I couldn't pitch, but I thought I was going to be a pitcher. And I was going to eventually get in the Hall of Fame. And for one day, I rode that idea. And it was like, it was all over me. And, uh, and the reason for that, the reason it happened, was because one day after practice, the day before a game, we were, we were finished practicing and we were just playing around with each other and waiting for our parents to come and pick us up. And so we were batting and pitching and taking turns doing that. And so I, I decided to go up to the mound and, and try, try to pitch, which I knew I couldn't do, but I thought, let me give it a, let me give it a try. So I started pitching, and I, I actually struck out the, the first guy. And then the other guy came up, and I struck out the second guy. And then the other guy came up, and I struck him out. And it, it kept going, right? I'm not exaggerating this story. This is one of these great stories that you have a childhood that you could come back to later on when you become a preacher and tell people how stupid you are, okay? All right. So I struck out the next one. And, and then, because this kept happening, the, the manager, the coach, he, he, um, uh, he saw it. And he's like, and I'd already thought, I'm a prodigy. But he saw it, and he's thinking in his head, I know, Oh, my goodness, we have missed out on something here. So he came over to me, and he said, this is pretty extraordinary what you're doing. I'm going to start you at pitcher in the game tomorrow. Okay? So I was so, and this starts my journey of 24 hours to get to the next day. I was so thrilled. I was pumped. I was like, I can't believe it. I was, I was so full of myself that I'm this great pitcher. So the next day, the game came. And I'm on the mound, and we start the game. And you may be a little bit surprised to hear this, because I think you know where the story's going to go. But I, I pitched, and I actually struck out the first guy. I did. And then the second guy comes up, and I pitch. And he gets a hit, base hit. We, we get him, we get him out. 
And then the coach of the other team, the manager of the other team, he pulled all his players together. I have no idea what he said to them, but I imagine it was something like this. That kid can't pitch. (laughs) He doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't know how to pitch. And he's probably erratic and very much out of control when he throws the ball hard at all. So what he's doing is he's throwing it with just enough speed to get it across the plate, right? And what you guys aren't used to is you aren't used to that. You're used to fastballs because this is small kids playing ball. You're used to fastballs, right? And what he told, I know he told his, his team, team this, just, just slow down, wait for it, and knock it out of the park. <laughs> and so the next guy came up, and he slowed down, and he waited for it, and he knocked it out of the park. <laughs> and the next knocked it out of the park, and the next knocked it out of the park, so that I was knocked back to way out there in the outfield. <laughs> Now, it's a humorous story about a kid being puffed up and just thinking arrogantly about himself and, and, uh, and all that. But it, it becomes much more serious, that kind of thinking that we're so much. We, we puff ourselves up. We make ourselves so significant as we get, as we get older. And, and in addition, it becomes a very serious thing when it happens in the church. In fact, it is something that can, can seriously harm the church. It can divide the church. It can break the church apart. And this is what Paul is concerned about, I think, in 1 Corinthians. And certainly, I think, in this passage he is. He even talks about it. This is where I get this from. It's in in verse 6. If you notice the very end of verse 6, he says this, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. Now, what what he's basically doing there is saying, the reason I'm writing this is so that will stop happening in the church, that none of you will be puffed up one against another. Now, we have seen the way that Paul does that. I mean, from the beginning of our study in 1 Corinthians, we've seen these, these different members of the church dividing up, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas. Some were even saying, I follow Christ. They were saying all these things divided up. Now we can clearly see that the reason they were doing that wasn't simply because they appreciated certain things that each one brought, which is something that we can kind of do. I mean, I, I know today, I mean, we, we because of, of technology and so forth, we listen to a lot of different teachers and are influenced by preachers and teachers that are out there. We listen to online and all that. And that's a, that's a good thing. That's not a bad thing as long as you're listening to people that are actually handling the word properly, right? But that's a good thing because it helps you and it helps you to grow and it helps you to mature and all that's good. And usually when in churches, when that's happening, you're not coming up to me and going, uh, I don't like you and I'm not gonna follow you because I listen to this particular internet preacher. That's usually not what's driving you. It was driving the, the folks in, in Corinth. Because what they were doing isn't just this. I appreciate things Paul does, and I appreciate things Apollos does, or I appreciate things that Cephas does. What they were doing was they were basically saying, I think Paul is better than Apollos and Cephas. Or I think Apollos is better than Paul or Cephas. And because I think they're better, if I follow them, if I attach to them, then what that means is I am better than you. That's what they're doing, okay? Because this is what happens. Whenever we're puffing ourselves up and exalting ourselves, it it always has this horizontal reality to it. It's like, I'm better than you because of some particular thing. And it was dividing the church in Corinth. And so what Paul does in this particular passage is he he writes here, I believe, to bring them back to what I would describe as, as spiritual sanity or spiritual health. He's bringing them back so they can begin to understand rightly who they are, right? Rightly understand what the Christian life is about. And and through that, to really begin to understand the church. And specifically, I think because this was the problem here, how the church would be united. And so he offers guidance. And there's four ways that I think he guides them in this passage. And I promise I'm gonna be brief in each of these points today. Four ways he offers them guidance. And the first way is this, which is, I mean, if you think about it, it's the most obvious and most important thing. It is the the guidance of God's word, the guidance of God's word. He wants them to be guided by the word, which all of us should want, right? I mean, this is is the thing. I mean, if you think about what is it that should lead us as Christians? What is it that should shape us as Christians? What is it that should shape us as the church? Well, that is the word of God. It's the word of God. Because if it's not the word of God, it's going to be 
the things of the world. I mean, we, if, you, if you keep up with church news, you just witnessed that this week. If you were keeping up with the news about what's going on in the United Methodist Church and all those decisions, the reason why that happens in the United Methodist Church is because they're not committed to the word. And if you're not committed to the word, then what is gonna happen? You're gonna end up committed to all kinds of other things and influenced by all kinds of other ideas. And that's what's happening there. And so we need to always come back to the word of God. What does it say? Now, where do I see that in this text? Well, if you notice again in verse six, I think it's there. I think it's there in the way Paul writes this. He says this again, the, whole, the entirety of verse six. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. Now, at the end of this, which is what I read at the beginning, he, he doesn't want them to be puffed up one against another. But what leads into that are two, two things that he's saying here that are, that are things to prevent them from being puffed up against one another. And so the first one is the first part of verse six where he says, I've applied all these things to myself and Apollos and for your benefit. What, what he's doing is he's talking about the things that he's already written, the things earlier. And if you have been here, you will know that in the first part of chapter four and in chapter three, Paul specifically writes a lot about himself and Apollos. And he says a number of different things that he's applying to them so they will understand, right? Remember what they are. He says, here's how you are to think of us, that we are servants of Christ and servants of the church and stewards of the mysteries of God. Remember that? Okay. What Paul is saying in verse six, at the very first part of verse six is this. The reason I'm saying this about us, the reason I'm saying that we're servants of Christ, servants of the church and stewards of the mysteries of God is not for me and Apollos, it's for your benefit. In other words, the problem isn't between Paul and Apollos. The problem is in the Corinthian church. And he's saying, the reason I'm laying this out so clearly for you that we're servants and stewards is because you need to know how to view us so that, end of verse six, you don't puff yourself up one against another, okay? But then he gives, in verse six, another reason for that because he goes on to say, this is the middle of verse six, that you may learn by us, not to go beyond what is written. Not to go beyond what is written. What is he talking about? Well, in one way, as you look at that, you could say what Paul has written to them, the letter of 1 Corinthians, which would, be, which would certainly be true. We know, I mean, Paul, Paul, and this would have been true for them too. Paul's an apostle. He writes with apostolic authority. He writes to them things that they need to pay attention to and not go beyond. That's one thing. Today, we understand that the first Corinthians is a part of the, the a part of the canon of scripture. It's the Bible. It is the word of God. It is true, right? But what I think Paul is specifically doing here when he says not go beyond what is written is he's showing his own commitment to the word of God. Because remember, Paul, when he went into Corinth, he would preach the word. What would the word be? He would preach from the Old Testament. That was Paul's Bible. That was Jesus' Bible. That would have been the Corinthians' Bible, right? To the, to the closing of the New Testament canon. And what Paul is saying is when he tells them, don't go beyond what is written, what he's actually referencing are the things that he's actually quoted to them earlier from the Bible. And you can see this. Remember, don't go beyond what is written. That's the language he uses. Well, if you turn back to chapter 1, verse 19, he says this, for it is written. And then he quotes from where? The Old Testament. He quotes specifically from Isaiah 29, 14, where he says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. He's basically saying, here's what the Bible says about the wisdom of this world. It will be destroyed by God, okay? All right, in chapter three, in verse 19 and 20, remember, don't go beyond what is written. In chapter three, verse 19 and 20, he says, for the wisdom of the world is folly with God, for it is written. And then he quotes, first of all, from Job 5.13. He catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, then he quotes from Psalm 94.11. The Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, and they are futile. What is he basically communicating? He said, here's what the word of God says. That all the wisdom and the thinking and the ways of this world, this world system that's in rebellion to God, God sees it, he knows it, it may be crafty, but they're not gonna get away with it. It will be judged. What he's telling them is don't go beyond what the word of God says about this world. 
Don't go in a different direction from what the word of God says about this world. Don't go beyond what is written. In other words, don't listen to the world's ways because if you do, here is the direction you're going to go. You're gonna boast in self and you're gonna boast in this world. But instead, listen to the wisdom of God's word because if you do, you will boast in the Lord alone. This is the reason why the New Testament scholar D.A. Carson, and he comments on this verse, he says this. You can put that up on the screen. Keep your finger on the text. You hear that? Keep your finger on this, on the word. And it will keep guiding you away from self and this world and to him, okay? The second guidance. So the first is the guidance of God's word. The second form of guidance that he gives is the guidance of grace, of God's grace, the guidance of grace. And again, I mean, if you think about what he's, what he's dealing with, he's dealing with people lifting themselves up, pushing themselves up, propping themselves up, okay? If you, if you really understand grace, then you actually begin to understand you, I mean, goodness gracious, you have no right whatsoever to, to ever exalt yourself if you get grace, right? And, and that's what Paul goes on to talk about. And so in verse seven, he, he asks, he starts, he asks three questions in verse seven. And they start with the words who, and then what, and then why, okay? And so here's what he says in verse seven. For who sees anything different in you? That's the who. The what, what do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, the why, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Now, the last two questions, the what and the why, they're pretty clear. We understand those. It's the first one that we don't quite get, and where it says, for who sees anything different in you? It's hard to, to wrap your mind around what that actually means. And the reason for the translation, you'll see different translations of, of this, is the Greek is hard to, to understand. The, the, the New International Version, though, puts it in another way, in a way that I think is helpful to get at Paul's point. And here's what the, the New International Version, uh, what it says about uh, verse 7. It says, for who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Now think about that. Who makes you different from anyone else? I mean, it could be who makes you different from anyone else in this sense. And if you are different than others, which all of us are, what he's basically saying is who, gave, who did that for you? He's drawing our attention to the one who did it. I mean, there are people that have all kinds of varying gifts and abilities and all these different kinds of things. But what Paul is asking is a very simple question. Who made you that way? Who allowed you to be this particular person that you are, right? And give you the things that you have. Or it could very well be that what Paul's doing is he's saying this. Who makes you different from anyone else? It could be, who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Lifting yourself up like this. And then he goes on to say, all right, what do you have? This is why I think he is leaning into presumption there. Who do you think you are? Because he's like, what do you have that you weren't given, that you didn't receive? And if you, if you, if you received it, then why in the world for something that was given to you as a gift from God, would you possibly spend your time boasting over that thing? That's what he's doing. Now, here's the thing. If anybody, I, well, let me say it another way. Everybody should get this because everybody's a recipient of God's grace, whether it's common grace or salvific grace. We're recipients of both. So everybody should get this. But my brothers and sisters in Christ, if anyone must, it is us because we know it. We know his grace. We know that the only reason we're saved is because of his grace. We know that the only reason we have the things that we have is because of his grace. And if you don't know that today, let me encourage you to do something. Keep pushing back. In other words, well, I got a job and I made all my money. Okay, push that back a little bit. Actually, don't even push it back very far. Push it back to this. Who let you wake up today? And you already got it. The matter's done. It is all of his grace. That's what he's saying. So that when we understand, and this is, remember, he's pushing against pride. He's pushing against self-exaltation. He's pushing against just propping yourself up and saying you're all of that. When we get 
God's word and what it says about this, and we get grace and its reality at work in our lives, all that it means, then it begins to help to humble us and to understand what our purpose here is, is to ultimately exalt him. Okay? That leads into the third form of guidance, which is the guidance of not yet. The guidance of not yet. Okay. Now, that may come across as a bit odd, right? Have the quotation marks around not yet, because I'm getting into something specifically. But a way for you to, I think, kind of get your mind around it, because all of us have, who, who have had little kids, or if you have little kids, and you go on a long you know, driving trip with them, you know what this is like, right? You get you know, maybe two, three hours up the road, and all of a sudden you hear your kid, are we there yet? Right? Are we there yet? And parents that are patient, which we should be, they'll say soon, or we're not there yet, or be patient, we'll get there soon, okay? It is this idea of already being there, right? Already being there, it's wanting to be in the final destination. But the truth is that we're still on the journey. It's the not yet part of it, okay? This plays itself out in theology, this language of the already and the not yet. And it plays itself out in an area of theology called eschatology. And eschatology is the study of final or last things, or the culmination of all things. That's the focus of, of eschatology. And a biblical eschatology holds to this idea of the already and the not yet. And by the already, there is a, the, a very real embrace, which I think all of us need to have, a real embrace of the fact that through the, the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ, that the kingdom of God is moving. It is at work in this world. And all authority has been given to him in heaven and earth. That God is at work. That God is accomplishing his purposes in this world. Right? And so as the church of the living God, I think we as believers in Jesus Christ should have a, a confidence and an, an optimism, if you will, about the advancement of the gospel. That the gospel is going to advance. That God's purposes are going to be accomplished. That God is going to do what God is going to do in the world. And that nothing is going to stop that. Nothing is going to stop that. No matter how difficult at times, how, how strong the opposition looks against us, God's will is going to be done. Jesus is going to assure it because he has all authority in heaven and earth right now. That is the already. But there is still a not yet. That the fullness of the new heavens and the new earth are not now. That all the things of the new heavens and the new earth are not here now. That we still live in a world of sin. We still live in a world of opposition. We still live in a world where people are in rebellion to God. All of those things are true. There's still evil in the world. Now, here's the problem that I think the Corinthians are facing. It's called, let me just go back to the word eschatology, which is the wrapping up of all things. It's called an overrealized eschatology. To give you an example of a way an overrealized eschatology works in something that all of us are aware of, it, is, um, it would be prosperity theology. Or, or health and wealth theology, that, that all the riches, and we need to know that because there will be no scarcity, there will be no need in heaven, there will be none in glory. I mean, we will all be utterly and absolutely satisfied in, in our new and glorified bodies. It will be wondrous in every possible way. But what health and wealth theology says is this, it says those things actually can be ours, all those things can be ours right now, if you just have enough faith, they can be yours right now. And hey, honest truth is, God blesses some of us with a lot. Praise God for that. But he sure does not make a promise in scripture that he will bless everybody with faith with all the things of eternity now. That's an overrealized eschatology. The Corinthians have that. And I will tell you how I know. It's the way Paul uses the words already. He uses them twice, twice, back to back. And in, in a way, he's even implying a third use of it in verse 8, where he says, already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. And he doesn't use the word already next, but he might as well have used it. Because what he says is, without us, you have, doesn't use the word already, but it's there, become kings. Okay, but we know Paul is being sarcastic here. And the reason we know he's being sarcastic is because of what he goes on and he says next. 
He, notice what he says next in verse 8. And, and would that, that you did reign so that we might share that rule with you. In other words, what he's basically saying is, I wish it were true. I wish you were reigning right now. Because if you were reigning right now, if that really were the case, then I would be reigning with you. They think they're there. But they're not. And we're not. Now, don't let this scare you. Because the victory is assured. Let it prepare you. You may have times where you're going to see all kinds of wondrous success, advancement, movement. And there are going to be other times when you're going to be hit and you're going to be hurt and you're going to be persecuted and you're going to, live, you're going to lose your life. What this helps us to do is to have an appropriate, in my mind, Optimism about the advancement of the kingdom of God and not become worldly triumphant. Like if we just are there and we just say it, that all the world is going to be different. I would caution you against that. That sense of the new and all that it is breaking into now. God's going to bring us there. He's going to get us there. But the route by which God leads us to get there and how and the things, the triumphs and the difficulties we face along the way, I'll trust the Lord with those. Okay. That leads to the final thing. So think about it. Guidance from God's word. Guidance from, from grace. Okay. Guidance from the not yet. But the final thing is the guidance from godly examples. And that's what Paul wants the Corinthians to have godly examples so they can look and say this is what the christian life actually can look like this here what i'm showing you okay and what it ultimately has to look like are men and women and here in this case paul gives the example of the apostles but men and women who are surrendering to and following with all of their hearts and all of their lives jesus christ and him crucified okay so if you notice what he says in verse 9 he says, for I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. And you're not going to fully understand those, that verse if you don't put it up against verse 8. Because in verse 8, here's, here's what he's doing. He's, he's talking to the to Corinthians and he's saying to them, here's what you guys are doing. You're thinking that already you are rich. Already you have all you want. Already you are kings. This is the way you view the Christian life, is that. Verse 9, he's saying, now let me tell you how the apostles think about this and how we view the Christian life. And what he's doing in verse 9 is, it, nine is interesting because, and, and they would have gotten this in the first century world because they would have known Roman triumphal entries and all those kinds of things. And so they would have gotten the imagery and so what the, what the Corinthians are doing is basically this. They're saying we're kings. And so in a Roman triumphal entry, what would happen is that the king or the, em the emperor or the general that won the victory or whomever, they would be out front. They would be the, the ones out front in front of everybody leading the procession. And the Corinthians are wanting that. They're wanting to be in front of everybody leading the procession because they're at the top. But Paul says here, what? He says, this is how we view us. It's like we're last of all. See those words? Last of all. What is he describing? He's describing this image of the Roman, Roman processional, and what he's saying basically is this. You think you're up front, but here's where we are. We're way back here on the tail end. We're way back in the back, and you know who was in the back? The captives, the slaves, the people that were, were turned over for spectacle on exhibit. He uses that word, spectacle. He uses that word for everybody to look at and laugh at and taunt and humiliate. And they were led, he says here, sentence of death to what? Into the Colosseum to be consumed by lions or killed by gladiators. Paul is saying here, this is the apostles. And that's you. Now, don't misunderstand this. 
because Paul's not a masochist. He isn't a person that loves pain and suffering and difficulty and just seeking out martyrdom. He's not, he's not. In fact, one of the things that's interesting to think about, both in relationship to Paul and Jesus, that there were times in Paul's life and times in Jesus' life where they avoided the point of suffering. They avoided the difficult thing. That, that there are actually times when that is the case. But for us to ever think that this means that we're not back here when we follow Jesus, that when we follow Jesus, we're gonna face it and Jesus say, if you follow me, what? I was persecuted, so will you be. We're not immune to that. We're not immune to the hostility and the hatred of this world. We don't just conquer it. The point in all of this is what Paul is wanting for them is to follow hard after Jesus. He wants it all. And when we do, I don't know what the end results will be. I don't know. And you don't either. But if you think it's always gonna be you on top, you're gonna quit. I assure you. So what does he do? He goes on and he contrasts further. Verse 10, down through the first part of verse 12. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. He's not saying that in a way to celebrate them. This is all their wisdom in the world stuff. We are weak. You are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, this is that challenges that, that not yet thing. When he says the present hour, he's saying right now, this is the case for us. The present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless and we labor working with our own hands. That's the Christian experience too. Do you understand that? Because what it looks like, and this is what he's doing, they're saying we're, we're messengers, as apostles, we're messengers of the gospel. And as messengers of the gospel, we are following the, the chief and primary messenger, Jesus Christ, and we are being formed by him. And so at the end of this section, in verse 12, second part, down through verse 13, he says this, when reviled, we bless. Who did that before them? Jesus did. When persecuted, we endure. Who did that before them? Jesus did. When slandered, we entreat. Who did that before them? Jesus did. We have become and are still. He's saying it again. Right now is what he's saying. Are still right now. Like the scum of the world and the refuge of all things. And who was treated like that before them? Jesus was. When he was crucified outside of a city. But he is alive and victorious, and so will all of us be, regardless of what, what may happen to us here. Why? Because we are secure in Jesus, and we praise him for that. There is no one that is going to stop God's people, and not even death itself, because Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this time in your word. We thank you for your faithfulness to your people, and we thank you for holding us and keeping us and assuring us, Lord, of your ultimate victory in this world. As we today, Lord, celebrate you and through your word, we also celebrate you and spend time with you through the table. And so we pray as we come this morning that you would meet us in our need and meet us in our hurt and our desire and our our brokenness and all the things that are going on in our midst and in our homes and in our families and in our lives and that you would meet us and assure us, Lord, that you love us and that you're present with us and that you are at work through whatever hardship we may be facing. And I know there are many in this congregation that are facing a lot, that whatever that may be, you have us and that nothing can prevent you from loving us, Lord. Nothing can separate us from your love. There is no condemnation in those who are in Christ. And that, Lord, we know that the future, heaven and earth, are ours.
May we live faithfully and follow you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.